Please give a really warm welcome to Marianne Williamson. It is an honor to be here as always, but it feels particularly good uh, to be uh, here tonight and um, during this very sorrowful time. I'm glad that we all have this opportunity to join with people of like mind in the hope that our conversation will be of use. So please join with me. Let's take a deep breath. And we close our eyes. We see in the middle of our mind a little ball of golden light. And we watch this light as it begins to grow larger and larger. Until now it covers the entire inner vision of our mind. And we see for ourselves within this light a beautiful temple. We see a garden that surrounds the temple and a body of water that flows through the garden. We see that the inside of the temple is lit by the same beautiful golden light. And we are here for we have been drawn together by the power and in the presence of God. We devote our time spent together tonight praying that God's most Holy Spirit be upon us. We pray, dear God, for Paris, for all of the people whose lives have been affected by the horrors of this week. And we pray for the miracles within us and around us that will save this gorgeous world. And so it is together, we all say, amen. <clears throat> when the AIDS crisis first hit, in the United States, it was in the 80s, I was living in Los Angeles, and that was one of the ground zeros for the explosion of that particular horror. The United States was slower than many countries, and I think that includes yours, in embracing a real holistic paradigm when it came to medical healing. But during the AIDS crisis, it was impossible to look at traditional allopathic medicine and think that it could give us all the answers that we needed because it took quite a while for Western traditional allopathic medicine to have anything at all in terms of drugs and other medical treatment that would help people with AIDS. But people with AIDS didn't say, oh, okay, I guess I'll go die now. Rather, people with AIDS and those who loved them began to expand their thinking that maybe there was more to healing than only what allopathic medicine could provide. And allopathic medicine, while very important in many cases, has to do with the suppression and eradication of symptoms. It sees health as the absence of sickness. But the shift into what at first was called alternative, then was called complementary, and finally landed where it belongs at integrative medicine, realized that health is not the absence of sickness, sickness is the absence of health. So as the paradigm shifted, the concentration became, how do we keep the body from being sick to begin with? How do we cultivate health? And how do we use more aspects than just allopathic ones in treating disease once it has occurred. And the whole body, mind, spirit paradigm of holistic integrative medicine comes from that. The realization that should the body be sick, you don't just treat the body, you treat the mind and the spirit as well. Now, I was very involved during that time with the AIDS crisis. And so I was rather front and center to a real shift that occurred within the medical community. A shift from looking at people such as myself who would hold AIDS support groups, emotional groups, spiritual groups, psychological groups. We were very patronized, condescended to, little pats on the head, 
The best they could come up with, it seemed, were lines like, well, if you can help them cope, if you can make them feel better. But as the crisis increased, and the horror increased, and it became clearer and clearer that it was going to take a while for Western allopathic medicine to come up with any hope whatsoever. The traditional medical community, at least in my country, began to be humbled. And lines like, oh, well, if you can, if you can help them cope, that's nice, turned into, what have you got? What is happening today among the allopathic political healers, namely governments, politicians, those who over the last few decades have run the primary engines of politics, society, and economics, certainly in my country, but in many ways in yours and other Western nations as well, might not be expressing in front of the lights or in front of the microphones what they are feeling. But if you and I think about it for even five minutes, they are as scared as everybody else is, and if they were honest, they would say, what have you got? And so I think it's time for all of us to embrace for ourselves a holistic, integrated paradigm when it comes to healing society. When you look at something like terrorism, when you look at the horrifying events, Friday night in Paris, when you look at so much of what's happening, the explosion of the power of ISIL and so forth, when we think of what's going to happen now, the question goes to what should we do? Which is a very allopathic outlook. What can we do to treat the symptoms? What can we do to eradicate the symptoms? What can we do to suppress the symptoms? Now, during World War II, you could liken Hitler and the Japanese Imperial Army to operable cancers. They could be, and they were, brilliantly, by my country, by your country, by all the Allies, dealt with brilliantly. Their invasive measures were necessary, and invasive measures worked. What we have today is a cancer that has already metastasized. And anybody who is even pretending to themselves that it's as simple as cutting out a little of the cancer here and cutting out a little of the cancer there might be still fooling themselves, but certainly is not fooling most of us. If we look at the integrative paradigm, however, we recognize dimensions of healing and dimensions of possibility that otherwise are not recognized. And those of us who are spiritual seekers have much to contribute to the conversation. I felt for a very long time that those of us who are spiritual seekers should be the last people sitting out the, la the great political, social, and economic questions of our day. And we are certainly the last people who should be sitting things out today. If all that we can provide is loving hashtags on social media and constant conversation about how love is the answer, then I think that we are not digging as deep as we need to be digging into the contribution that we could be making at this time. We know that forgiveness is the answer, but if we're going to be talking about forgiveness is the answer, you can't really have a meaningful conversation about forgiveness until first you name what it is you need to forgive. Now I know that I'm not talking to an American audience, but I also know, as do you, that Britain went along with the United States in the invasion of Iraq. And I know, as do you, that Britain, like America, has had the ships in the Persian Gulf and so forth for quite a few years. So it is really time for the people of the Western world to grow up and like children who have been betrayed by their parents and can hardly stand to face the fact that mommy and daddy were not as smart or not as good as we thought, I honestly believe it is time for people in my country, 
perhaps to some extent to your country. I don't live in your country, so it's your job to take care of your country like it's my job to take care of mine. But at least insofar as Britain played along with the United States government, either in the invasion of Iraq or in the failure to disband NATO when it could have been disbanded once the Berlin Wall fell, continuing to foster and to maintain nothing short of a war machine by which many people got very, very, very rich. Yes, forgive it, but let's name it first. Why do we need to do this? We need to do this because there is a power, a power which in both Judaism and Christianity is called the atonement. You know, Buddha was born about 500 years before Jesus. And he said that action was followed by reaction. All action is followed by a reaction. Called karma in the East, and in the West, it's called the law of cause and effect. Now, Jesus was born about 500 years later. Now, the Jews, the, the most holy day of the year in Judaism is Yom Kippur, or the Day of the Atonement. So the Atonement principle far predated the birth of Jesus. But the message of Jesus in terms of the Atonement was just as Buddha said, action, reaction, action, reaction, the message of Jesus was, but in a moment of grace, the karma is burned. And so the Day of Atonement, the Atonement principle has to do with what you might think of as a kind of cosmic reset button. So as I already mentioned here today, if we are honest with ourselves as Westerners, we see a lot of things over the last few decades. More than anything else, I believe, but who knows at this point, certainly the invasion of Iraq. You know, if somebody comes to me and says, you know, Marianne, I have these problems, but 90% of it was other people. The message from a metaphysical perspective is, well, let's talk about the even 10% that was yours. A Course in Miracles says you pay a very high price for not taking 100% responsibility for your problem. If you don't take 100% responsibility for your problem, then the price you pay is that you cannot solve it. So I'm not saying about my country or any other country that what is happening today with ISIL is all our fault. I'm not saying that because I don't believe it. But to say that we did not have a part to play, both in terms of immigration policies, I know some of the issues in Europe are different than ones in, in my country, my sense of things in terms of what's going on over there, Mainly, at that time, mainly more than anyone that's on America, what's happening in Europe obviously is on Europe and not on us. But we are all together now. We are all woven together with the problem. The issue of atonement is that when we, and only if we, fully acknowledge, you know, Catholics do it as they go along. It's called confession. Jews do it with that one big day of the year, the day of Yom Kippur. And if you're familiar with the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, the same principle of making amends, the same principle of admitting the exact nature of your wrongs. For those of you who are interested in the historical issues here, there was an article yesterday uh, on Huffington Post, that would have been November 17th of this year, 2015, by a gentleman named David Stockman. And David Stockman was actually, he's a conservative, he was, uh, he was uh, the finance, head of finance economic issues for Ronald Reagan, so this is no liberal. And yet he tells a story, a historical timeline that I think is extremely important for all of us to understand about what happened and what were the actual policies, what were the actual decisions made, what were the actual underlying historical factors which got us where we are today. Like I said, some of them in Britain will be different than in America. Some of them in, in, in other countries and other people who are, who are here tonight. But the basic issue has to do with the fact that if in fact we wish to be part of the solution, we must analyze, we must understand as much as possible about the problem. Once again, many times people from the higher consciousness community say, well, I just want to pour pink paint all over it. I just want to pink, 
pour a light all over it. I just want to love. I've seen my own quotes, you know, used this way. I call it sharegraphic spirituality. I did say, and I will say it here tonight, and I will, will shout it from the rooftops, that the only thing more powerful than hate gone viral is love gone viral. But love is fierce, and love is intelligent. And love is not something that just pours light over the darkness. The Course in Miracles says, you cannot bring the light to the darkness. You must bring the darkness to the light. And so we heal, whether it's healing as individuals or healing as civilizations. We heal through a kind of detox process. And that detox process has to do, just as in the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, when you actually have to write down or to admit your character defects to write down and to admit your character defects. When it has to do with education, often there's an issue where people open their borders, but they don't really open their hearts. They open their borders, but they don't really allocate the kind of resources that will help people assimilate and integrate economically and educationally and so forth. Once again, you are stewards of your na national journey. I'm uh, one of 300 and however many million uh, stewards of mine but there is no more grace period. Our capacity to be used as a collective field of healing at this time has to do with how deep we are willing to go. Allopathic healers are working on the horizontal level, but on the horizontal level, there is a limit to what can be done. We are in a pickle now. We are now in a situation where some people who only see through a rational perspective, who only see through a mortal ego perspective, are scared. And when they say to people from the higher consciousness community, what have you got? We're not scared, because our answer is miracles. What we have is that power which is in us but not of us, the power of God that is within us all, the power by which as our hearts and minds are realigned with the truth of God within us, we literally break open the heavens. What does that mean? The Course in Miracles says that a miracle is a shift in perception from fear to love. And that is a divine intercession from a thought system beyond our own, whereby breakthroughs then occur on the mortal realm that would not have otherwise been possible. First of all, the Course in Miracles says, there is no order of difficulty in miracles. So if you only look at the current problem with ISIL and so forth from a rationalistic perspective, it is not reasonable to understand how we're gonna deal with this. It, it, you, you, your reason cannot come up with a strategy. It's not as simple as, well, we'll handle it over here, we'll handle it over here. Once again, like World War II. It was difficult, but you could see how a certain strategy could be uh, put into place. And I don't know how, how the British are, but I know the Americans were very good with a to-do list. Just tell us what to do, and then we'll go into that. The Western mind wants to know what to do. When you have the kind of problem that we have today, sorry, the, oh, the biggest question is not first, what do I do? The biggest question is, who do I need to be? Because it is in finding that new, not that it's new, but the original, the essential, and the fundamental aspect of self, self with a capital S, which is repudiated and resisted by the mortal ego, then we become aligned with that power, in us but not of us, which then creates possibilities for breakthrough that do not otherwise exist. Why is that? It is because the realm of the spirit is not tied, attached, or even of itself inherently present within the three-dimensional plane. The three-dimensional plane, according to Buddha and according to A Course in Miracles, is like a veil. It is a mass hallucination. And all of these things are happening, all of the things that we're all so concerned about in the world today are happening within that vast illusion. The message of spirituality, however, is not to go into denial. There's a difference between transcendence and denial. Recognizing that this is all a vast illusion is not a pass on dealing with it. 
knowing that it's all a vast illusion is a tool by which we deal with it most effectively. We move into denial, yes, but it is positive denial. Negative denial is, I'll just put something loving on social media and that's the most that I can do. Positive denial is, I deny the forces of the world. I deny anything that is not love to ultimately stand in the presence of love. Love is to fear what light is to darkness. Fear is not a thing, it is the absence of a thing. Just as darkness is not a thing, it's the absence of a thing. You turn on the light, the darkness is gone. You turn on the love, the fear is gone. But the kind of love that we need now, this is not a, 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 this is not a gooey love. This is not a weak love. This is a fierce love. This is an intelligent love. This is the love that we are called to now. We begin by our being willing to search our own hearts in our own individual countries, seeing those things which we did with other countries, seeing those things which our own countries did, taking responsibility as citizens, doing what we need to do as we are guided and as we are directed to bring a consciousness of awareness in our own societies whereby we might be part of the conversation of a national and even international atonement on behalf of all of us, all of us as citizens who in any way countenanced, in any way acquiesced to the kind of insanity that helped to factor in and the creation, in fact, that factored in to the creation of the problems that we have now. And then we move on. We move on to the fact that number one, atonement works miracles. It is a cosmic reset button. The Course in Miracles says when you go back to the moment when the mistake was made, you fully recognize you did not allow your heart to lead. And look at Western civilization. We have not made love our bottom line. And on a certain level, ladies and gentlemen, what did we expect? We have allowed short-term economic gain for large multinational corporate forces to be the bottom line as we, as we went about our societal, our political, our economic decisions. Brotherhood and justice and love for our children and love for each other has not been our bottom line. And to the extent to which cause and effect simply is the building block of the universe, then once again, what did we expect the effect to be when our cause was that money and not love is the bottom line? But even though God himself, from a course perspective, will not interfere with the law of cause and effect, he created that law for our protection. The Course in Miracles says he will not change the level of effect, but he will help you should you request change on the level of cause. We begin with that process of atonement. And then what we receive is insight that we would not have otherwise had. And that insight, number one, there is no order of difficulty in miracles, so don't worry about it. This is all an illusion. It is all a hallucination. This will all be over. Love will prevail. God's will has never not been done. The issue that is ours to decide is how long that will take and how much human suffering will have to occur before we get it. The Course in Miracles says, it is not up to you what you learn, it is merely up to you whether you learn through joy or through pain. And that is what's happening to the human race right now. The human race is being challenged and being invited to evolve to our next level of awareness and consciousness. We are going through together what all of us go through in our own individual lives. Every situation from a course perspective is in our own individual lives is one in which life is saying, well, how do you want to do this? Do you want to do it the way you did it before? You can. You want to just kind of cry about this for a few days and then forget it and go back to the same way you operated before? Because you can. You want to play this from your neuroses and your weaknesses and your triggers? Because you can. But at any given moment that you choose, you can choose again. You can say, I might have weaknesses, I know I have weaknesses, but I don't have to act from them. I know I made mistakes in my past, but I can atone for those mistakes. And then I will not feel guilty, for the Spirit will allow me, will undo all the consequences of our wrong decisions if we will let Him. However, the Course in Miracles says that the line in the Bible that God shall not be mocked means that He isn't. So just fiddling around with these principles rather than deep atonement will not be enough. 
We might understand the principles intellectually, but we will not of ourselves become the kind of thinkers that form a collective field of alternative possibility unless we do. When we do, we know number one, there is no order of difficulty in miracles. And number two, we move into a space of knowing that just as on the external plane, there are networks of darkness. On the external plane, there are networks of terror. On the external plane, there are networks of fear. On the internal plane, there are networks of light. Now in the body, every cell actualizes and then collaborates with other cells in order to serve the healthy functioning of the organ and the organism of which they're part. Every once in a while, a cell decides it doesn't want to, for reasons we don't totally understand. A cell in the body says, no, I don't, I don't want to just contribute to the healthy functioning of the pancreas. I don't want to. I want to go off and do my own thing. And I want to surround myself with other cells who think the way I do, disconnected from any sense of service, disconnected from any sense of collaboration with other cells for the healthy functioning of that which is larger than they. What do we call that? Cancer. It is a malignancy in the body, and it is a malignancy in consciousness. And what has happened on this planet is that the human race, the consciousness of the human race, has been infected with malignant thought forms. Anytime we have a thought that it's just about me, that's a malignancy. Anytime we have a thought that I'm, I, I'm not here to serve the whole, I'm just here to get what I want, that's a malignancy. Anytime I'm thinking of myself in relation to others is on any other trajectory than how we might collaborate for a greater good, that is a malignancy. But the human race, the human body, would not have evolved over the millions of years that we have evolved unless it was also programmed into our system that we could take a hit. We can take an injury. We can take disease. We can take dysfunction. It's called the immune system. The consciousness with which you and I can now connect in this matrix of light on an invisible plane with people who I feel are thinking the exact kind of things that we're thinking here tonight all over the world. Just as on the physical plane there is a matrix of fear, on the internal planes there is a matrix of love. And so whereas it's easy to despair, because if we're only thinking in terms of ourselves, it's so easy to go into, but what can I do? I'm just one person. Once you sign up in your heart, once your dedication is how can I serve, how can I collaborate, then it's like an underground. Just like there was a French underground during World War II in the countries that were being occupied by the, by the Nazis. It was an underground, but they found each other. And on a spiritual level, the same thing is true. I don't know what you individually are supposed to do, but God, spirit, voice for God will tell you what you're supposed to do. Spirit's not going to tell you what I'm supposed to do. Spirit's not going to tell me what you're supposed to do. But the universe is like a house that is wired for electricity. And each and every one of us are lamps. It doesn't matter the shape of the lamp or the form of the lamp or the design of the lamp or the color of the lamp. What matters is that the lamp get plugged in. So we are at a time of darkness, but the house is wired for electricity because the electricity is inherent in life itself. The issue is not even that we lack lamps because we are the lamps. The issue is that the lamps are not plugged in. We have thought, we have been idolaters. We have thought that, no, my power comes from the money or my power comes from technology or my power comes from business or my power comes from my body. And so every time we plug into that thought, we forget where our real power source is. And so now we have to plug into the divine electricity whereby we will be able to be conduits for a light that is not of this world. Every time we pray, we plug in. Every time we meditate, we plug in. Every time we forgive, we plug in. Every time we get over ourselves, we plug in. Every time we start the day knowing that all we're here for today is to be in service to the light, to be ablaze with the glory of God, to say to God in our own ways, however we say them, use me, use my hands, use my feet. Each of us, in honoring our own incarnation, 
Just as every cell in the body is assigned, you, you're assigned to the liver, you, you're assigned to the lungs, you, you're assigned to the heart, you, you're assigned to the bones. Well, you, you're assigned to Britain, you, you're assigned to France, you're assigned to Russia, you're assigned to Syria, you're assigned to the United States. You, you're assigned to the arts. You, you're assigned to education. You, you're assigned to, to politics. You, you're assigned to business. That all of us begin to recognize that to the extent to which we are willing to be, we are of service to the light which casts out darkness. Now, from if, if any of us were to take an honest look at the world, I assume you would agree with me, the vast majority of people on this planet are so good the vast majority of people on the planet, that's the tragedy of this moment in history, that the world can be so beautiful, that the world can be so loving, and that most people want it to be. And then we have to ask ourselves, how did this happen? It happened because, of course, the miracles would say, along with many other paths, that there is a force within all of us. You know, many years ago, I said to myself, oh, Mary, you don't have to worry about the devil, that's all in your head. And then I remember stopping myself and thinking, that's the worst place it could possibly be. <laughs> so even though from a metaphysical perspective, we don't think of a devil out there stalking the planet for people's souls, we do think in terms of a force of consciousness within each and every one of us by which we are tempted to perceive without love. And so whatever you call it, the Course in Miracles calls it ego, which is the product of the small, the belief, it is that malignancy, it is that thought, I'm only here for myself. I'm not here to collaborate, and I'm not here to care about the larger whole. That is where this all comes from. But we, in this holographic universe, we ourselves, in our own individual lives, can help heal the collective by tending to our own piece of the garden. That means that each and every one of us, of course, the miracle says, are given a highly individualized curriculum. As we know, some of us, your curriculum has you in Europe. Some of us, your curriculum has you in North America or wherever. All the, some of the things that we've already talked about here tonight. But it goes deeper than that. Your husband, your wife, your lover, your friend, your employees, your employer, your children, your parents, the individual relationships that we have on any given day. Now, for most of us, if you're even at an event like this tonight, you're probably like myself and most everyone I know. We're kind of placed pretty good. You know, you meditate, or at least I would think if, if, if you don't meditate, you at least know you should. If you, if you don't pray, you're at least thinking maybe there is something to that. If you're not, if you haven't forgiven everyone you know, you're at least starting to understand all the mechanics and why it matters and so forth. So my sense is that we have the critical mass that we need. What is the critical mass? The critical mass is never a majority. The majority doesn't wake up one day and say, free the slaves. The status quo isn't going to change itself. The status quo, by definition, is very happy with where it is. Societies do not change because the status quo, or the majority, wakes up one day and says, let's change. That's never been how civilizations change. Civilizations change because of a relatively small group of people usually considered outrageous radicals by the status quo of their time, who simply have a better idea. And what's happening on the planet today, you and I learned about this as children when we were first taught about evolution. We were taught about what happens when a species begins to behave in ways that are maladaptive for its survival. What will happen is that either a mutation will occur a mutation appear, so who even though that mutation does not represent the majority of the species, the descendants of the mutation then, then provide an alternative trajectory. At that point, either the entire species will move in that direction or the species will go extinct. What is happening on the planet today is that the collective behavior of the human species is maladaptive for our survival on this earth. We are the only species vigilantly destroying our own habitat. We are the only species taking the only home we have and selling it off like whores, like prostitutes, for money, for somebody to have some money, making our planet possibly inhabitable. And of course, it goes without saying that we are violent towards each other 
and violent towards each other while carrying extremely powerful weapons of mass destruction in ways that represent a probability trajectory that any reasonable person could fear could spell the end of civilization as we know it. But there's a mutation. Every great religious teacher represents the consciousness of the mutation. And all the great religious teachers, whether you're talking about Moses standing at the Red Sea, whether you're talking about Jesus healing the leper, in any of the great religious traditions, those and any others, one of the things that you see, central and fundamental, is that those people worked miracles. And they worked miracles because their minds had pierced the veil. Their thinking pierced the veil of the mortal illusion. They did not stop their perception at only what their physical senses perceived. They extended their perception to what the heart knew to be true. When Jesus, for instance, stood before the leper. Well, on the physical level, the leper has leprosy. But reality is not physical. Reality is not material. Reality, ultimate reality, is in that quantum realm beyond time and space where all things are possible. So on the level of ultimate reality, there's no such thing as someone who has leprosy. On the level of ultimate reality, the so-called leper is a perfect being, unchangeable, created by God, deathless, and incapable of anything that actually changes the being that God created them to be. Now Jesus, when he stood before the leper, he extended his vision. His mind had been healed of attachment to the mortal realm. It wasn't that he didn't see it, but he saw through it. He saw through it to the realm where the leper doesn't have leprosy. No, I, I see who you really are. You're this perfect Christ. It could be called Christ. It could be called Shekinah. It could be called light. I so don't care what you call it. It's irrelevant what we call it. But to see into that place, now what Jesus had was conviction. He was so convicted, he was so convinced that when he looked at the leper, he went right through, he saw right through the mortal realm. He saw that the leper, leper didn't really have leprosy. Jesus didn't believe in leprosy. He was so convicted that in his presence, the leper didn't believe in it either. And so the leper was healed. That is what the miracle worker does. There were people crucified to his left and crucified to his right, but we did not hear about them resurrecting. There were Israelites to the left of Moses and there were Israelites to the right of Moses. But theoretically, it was him and his consciousness which aligned with the power of God caused the Red Sea to part. And in religious, spiritual tradition, after religious and spiritual tradition, we are given that same coded message that there is a way to live, to think, that so increases our power that our minds become conduits for that quantum divine intercession whereby literally the molecules of the physical world begin to change. As it says in the Course in Miracles, time and space are under my control. Now, who's convicted on the planet today? When you think of people who are really convicted, who really know what they want and they're going for it, and there is no compromise, man, they're going for it, they are doing it. Who do you think of today? Terrorists. The most convicted people on the planet today are the haters. Every time there's a terrorist act, we're told that the cowardly act would not be tolerated. When you think about it, you think, I don't know, I can go with evil, I can go with unconscionable. But sometimes cowardly does not apply because the truth of the matter is hatred has a perverse kind of courage. So what you've got on the planet today is far more people who love than who hate, but those who hate, hate with conviction. I can't even imagine a kind of sort of sometimes, you know, convenient. What is casually convenient committed terrorist? But I know that many of us, and I know that I myself, have been and am one at times, sort of kind of casually, sometimes, you know, if it's convenient committed to love. And so what's happening on the planet today is not that more people hate than love, not by a long shot, but those who hate, hate with conviction that is not yet being demonstrated at the level it needs to be demonstrated by those of us who love. And that's what I meant a few minutes ago when I said most of us, from what I can see, we've pretty much got it going on. We know we need to be more loving. We know we need to be more compassionate. We know we need to be more forgiving. We need to be, no, we need to be service oriented. We know we need to pray more. We know we need to meditate more, but we still yelled at our mother on the phone today. We still passed up this or that opportunity to truly go into the vertical realm 
That's the thing. If you look at the Jewish Star of David as well as the Christian cross, you see that both of these symbols are visual representations of the intersecting of the vertical and the horizontal. So here's the horizontal. The horizontal plane of the world is the level of effect, but the vertical is the level of cause. So what we need to do now is to go deep into the vertical. Going deep into the vertical means, for instance, meditation. You know, a lot of people who say, oh yes, I meditate. I'll say, well, what do you do? And they say, um, well, I close my eyes and I just go quiet or something. That, ladies and gentlemen, is called relaxation. <laughs> all meditation is relaxation, but not all relaxation is meditation. For real meditation, where our brain literally emits different brain waves, for that we need a practice. Transcendental meditation, the workbook of A Course in Miracles, there's Buddhist meditation, there's Kabbalistic meditation, there are many different forms of meditation. You're living in a world-class city, I can only imagine how many meditation classes there are in London on any given day. And from a metaphysical perspective, there's only one truth, it's with a capital T, but it's spoken in many, many different ways. So for instance, there are some people in this room who know what spiritual practice speaks to you and works for you and you're doing it. Others of you, it's kind of like when you belong to the gym, you just don't go. So others of you, you have the book, you know what your practice is, you're just not doing it that much. And others of you go, you know this sounds right, I don't really know what my meditation practice should be. I don't, I don't even know. I assure you, if you ask in your heart right now, books will literally fall at your feet over the next few days. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to step it up. The last thing we need to do after the incidents in Paris the other night is cry for a few days and just go back to normal. Nobody's really going back to normal because everybody's on edge now. We all know that anything could happen in London, in Washington, in Los Angeles, and so forth. But let's not take that to mean that we just have to get on with being nervous. And I don't know how it is in the, in the United Kingdom, but in America, this has turned into a gold mine for pharmaceutical companies who are now just making sure that to the best of their ability, every man, woman, and child they can possibly get on an antidepressant will be on them. So drugs that should be used for serious psychotherapeutic conditions, such as schizophrenia or bipolar condition, are now being taken like candy an epidemic at least in my country, I hope not in yours. But this is not a time for any reason, however any of us might find to medicate ourselves. This is not a time to be numb. This is a time to grieve. This is a time to cry. One of the things that I realized the other night as I went through what I'm sure all of us have gone through, I was watching television and I saw some of the pictures of the people who had died and the in the concert hall and just the stories of these people and I just started crying uncontrollably as I'm sure most if not all of us did. And then I realized that where I went to in the depth of my sorrow, where I went to in completely surrendering to my tears because I had no choice was exactly where we need to be. And I was reminded of a line in Alcoholics Anonymous where they often say, every problem comes bearing its own solution. You know, when you get diagnosed, if people, when people get diagnosed with a life-challenging illness, one of the things I've noticed is that every, these meaningless preoccupations that dominate our lives. This assault of modernity, this barrage of ultimately meaningless stimulus. What you're told, you have a life-challenging condition, all of that drops in the first five minutes. And that's what happens when you hear something like a big terrorist attack in Paris. For the first five, in the first five minutes, boy, nothing unimportant was seen as important. 
all the distractions, all the craziness, all the stupid websites out. We were reminded of what's important. The issue when you've been given a life-challenging disease diagnosis is that tomorrow you are still going to be with that understanding. With what's happened now is that we are collectively diagnosed with a life-challenging condition. I hope that in your country, I hope that in mine as well, we do not go the direction that the United States went after 9-11. After 9-11, there was collective heartbreak, and we felt the love of the rest of the world. It was a profound moment of collective global sorrow, and out of that sorrow, there could have arisen something truly magnificent. I'm sorry to say that our president at the time told everybody just go back to shopping and they would take care of it, and we know what happened after that. The worst thing that could happen right now is that we, in a few days, start to try to forget any of this. The worst thing that could happen is that we start distracting ourselves again, which we will be tempted to do because that's what the ego mind that created all this to begin with wants us to do. Have our cry, have our upset, and then sort of collectively just fall into this new normal where any of us know that anything could happen at any time. Ladies and gentlemen, we must not go to sleep. We must remain awake. We are part of an army of light. We are immune cells, but immune cells have to actually every day be immune cells. What is HIV? What is AIDS except a disease of a compromised immune system? That's why AIDS and cancer are both so fundamentally metaphysical in nature. Not that the person who contracts the disease is necessarily expressing that consciousness at all, but collectively, just as cancer represents the malignancy of separating ourselves, so a compromised immune system means that situations which should never have gotten this dangerous should have been gobbled up a long, long time ago we're not, because there was a compromised immune system. And so right now, ladies and gentlemen, you know, once I, I was jogging and I, I uh, you know when a, an old tree, its roots come up, the, the cement comes up, I should not have been jogging on that sidewalk, obviously, but that's what happened. I ran into that and I fell and instinctively I put my hands in, in front of, of my face to protect myself. And so what happened was I had big cuts on my hands. The next few days were so fascinating because when you have a cut on that part of your body, more so than on any other part of your body, you're really watching hour by hour. And you're seeing the miraculous healing process by which the body takes care of itself. And I remember when my, it, it was so red, it was so red around the cuts. And I remember reading up and, and a doctor explaining to me, and he said, well, you know, that's, that's a good sign that it's so red. It means all the red blood cells are going right to it. And so we don't want to be people who do not grieve any more than we want to be people with no remorse. We don't want to be people who have no remorse about the behaviors of our nations. We don't want to be people who have no remorse about perhaps our own relative quietude and acquiescence to political decisions that we know we did not protest as perhaps now in retrospect we see that we should have. And to those of you, I have to tell you, those of you in England, I've said this to you before, whenever any British person gets the thought, ask, well, you guys invaded Iraq, I will tell you now, as I've said it again, I, you might just know that when we were trying our hard to protest that, when they were able to come in and say, well, Tony Blair agrees, I can't tell you how much mileage George Bush got from that. So we all can look at ways that maybe we did not show up as much as we might have shown up, acquiesce, we're a little too casual in our protest. Maybe there are people in this room who did everything that you possibly could. And then this obviously does not, that does not apply to you. But for most of us, if we're honest with ourselves, we can see ways that we did not repudiate. Because it is so tempting to want to be liked. And I think this is particularly true for women. But you know, a meaningful life is not a popularity contest. Don't expect, if you truly speak from conscience in a world that is not predicated on the dictates of conscience, do not expect applause from everybody around you. 
But at this point, if everything that we're doing and everything we're saying is getting applause from everybody, we might start questioning what it is that we're doing and what it is that we're saying. Because right now, we must form a collective field of alternative possibility. The Course in Miracles says that the miracle worker is someone whose mind holds a different possibility. That's what Moses was. That's what Buddha was. That's what Jesus was. And there are other great avatars and great religious figures, and I don't leave them out of my conversation because I don't believe that there were, but simply because those are the only three traditions that I know enough about that I can speak about with any integrity in, in public. But obviously, all the great religious traditions are conduits of truth in, in their mystical form. And the mystic, mystical path is the spiritual path. And the spiritual path is a path of the heart. It's not about doctrine, it's not about dogma, it's not about institutions, it's not about organizations. It's about the human race transforming abstract intellectual concepts. When we begin the spiritual journey, enlightenment begins with these abstract concepts. Abstract concept like, there is no order of difficulty from, uh, in miracles. Got it. If I've made a mistake and I go back to the moment that I made the mistake and recognize I made the mistake and now go back and give it to God now, God will give me a cosmic reset button. I don't have to feel guilty. All the consequences of the wrong decision will be undone if I will let him. Go atonement. Check. If I now give my life to God, waking up in the morning, just like you wake up in the morning and you, you take a shower, you take a bath because you, you don't want yesterday's dirt on your body. But if we don't wake up and purify our thinking, purify our hearts, if the first thing we do when we wake up in the morning is turn on the internet, turn on the computer, turn on the television, turn on the radio, watch, read a newspaper, take in all that fear, take in all that stuff, then we're waking up in the morning and giving our minds over to the consciousness and the fear of the world. I'm not saying never get there. It's important that we get there. The Course in Miracles says, Look at the crucifixion, but do not dwell on it. Higher consciousness, as I was saying earlier tonight, is not about ignoring what's going on in the world. It's about showing up to help transform what's going on in the world. And we, as seekers of higher consciousness, can contribute on those psychological levels, on those emotional levels, and on those spiritual levels. Spiritually, by meditation. Spiritually, by prayer. And that means, of course, prayer for those who we might call terrorists. And you know, there are those who say some governments are terrorists, blah, 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 blah. All that conversation isn't particularly helpful, except what is helpful is one idea in terms of meditation that you might choose to use. The Course in Miracles says that all of us are created innocent, and I don't believe that anybody who is creating heinous acts, including those people who killed all those people in Paris the other night, I don't believe they were born to be terrorists. I don't think they were born to hate. On the other hand, one of the big problems we have on the planet today is how many children are taught to hate from the times they were very, very, very young. Those people the Course in Miracles refer to as being temporarily inaccessible to the power of the atonement. And on a spiritual level, they need to be spiritually quarantined. What does that mean? That means that should this meditation, this visualization call to you, wake up in the morning and See in your mind's eye anyone with serious, violent intent <clears throat> surrounded by a golden egg. That golden egg, the, the eggshell itself, is made up of a kind of energetic titanium. <clears throat> and whatever malevolent thought, whatever genuinely violent, heinous thought is, is emanating from the mind of that person, it cannot become manifest because the titanium eggshell, they, the thought cannot move through into the, into the passage of manifestation. With, this is only blessed if you also, on the inside of the eggshell, pour forth a golden light from the eggshell onto the heart of the person, blessing them and praying that they be healed. It's the energetic equivalent of putting someone in prison. You know, you don't have to put someone in prison with a consciousness of hate or even a consciousness of punishment. It might just be that they are a danger to the public right now and need to be separated. And also, at certain times such as that, prison can have atonement value. 
We can pray in our own lives. The Course in Miracles says prayer is the medium of miracles. Now, prayer from a Course in Miracles perspective, prayer is a medium of miracles for this reason. I spoke before about cause and effect. Everything that's happening in our lives is the effect of a cause. There's cause with a little c, and there's cause with a big c. Cause with a little c is my ego consciousness. Cause with a big C is the God within us, a power in us but not of us that can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Now, like I said earlier, you can't ask God to change the effects in your life if you yourself aren't willing to change on the level of cause. That would be violating the law of, 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 of cause and effect. And also it would be a violation of our free will. Free will means we can think whatever we want to think. What we can't do, however, is minimize the power of our consciousness. What we can't do is minimize the power of our thoughts. So prayer is where you say, I want to change on the level of cause. I am willing, but I don't know how. You know, sometimes you're having an argument with a friend, and it's as simple as somebody saying to you, oh, lighten up, get over yourself. If that happened 10 years ago, forget it. And you can say, oh, you're so right, sorry. But sometimes somebody did something. And certainly what we're going through collectively now would represent this exponentially, where there's such a trigger, it's not as simple as simply changing your thought. Where the wound is so great, or the fear is so great. It's not as simple as just intellectually, oh, we'll think about it differently. Prayer is where we recognize that the altar to God is in our mind. And when you put a subject on the altar, you put a relationship on the altar, when you put this situation with ISIL on the altar, this situation with clash of civilizations on the altar, whatever we want to call or name the insanity that is running rampant on our planet today, that which we put on the altar is then altered. Because the altar is in our minds. I'm putting this relationship on the altar. That means may a great wave of forgiveness come upon us both. May that person see only the innocence in himself and the innocence in me. May I see only the innocence in him and the innocence in me. We put situations on the altar. Dear God, I place it in your hands. God's not outside us. God's inside us. That means, dear God, I am willing to think about this differently. I'm willing to see this differently. But I'm so triggered. This is so, this is such, this has all my abandonment panic, or this has all my avoidance issues, or this has all my codependency, or this has all my whatever those things are. But ladies and gentlemen, that stuff, given what's happening today, that was high school. And this is serious, serious graduate studies now. And it's time for us to take all of the things that we've all studied and been through. And the fact, that's why I said earlier tonight how wonderful that we could be together at a time like this. We can be together with other people who just like us. You don't come to someone like myself at this point in, in your life to hear something you don't already know. We've all been reading the same books. We've all been listening to the same tapes. And I've been saying this for a long time. The era of data collection is over. You don't come here to hear someone like myself or anyone at Alternatives to hear things you don't already know. We come together in groups like this right now in order to access more deeply those things which by now we all already know. But we know them as abstract principles. And it's time now for that journey without distance. That's what enlightenment is. Enlightenment is what happens when that abstract intellectual theory, because we are called by the individual experiences in our own lives, our own relationships, our own path, our own circumstances in our own lives, they are lessons. Are you applying the practice? Are you coming from your strength? Are you choosing to come from your weakness? Are you coming from your past and your future? Or are you choosing to come live in the present? Are you choosing to blame that person? Or are you choosing to bless them? These are attitudinal muscles. Just like you do yoga, go to the gym, to work out your muscles so you can move, so you can be strong, so you can move through the world. We do our spiritual exercises in order to train and hone our attitudinal muscles. Our attitudinal muscles enable us not to move, our attitudinal muscles enable us to be still. 
and in our stillness we can endure. And in our stillness, we are non-reactive. In our stillness, we are less vulnerable to the poppycock of the world. In our stillness, we are clearer, we are savvier, we are more intelligent, we are more wise, and we become finely tuned intuitional instruments. Just like when you download a file in the computer and you have to sit and wait, you know, and you see that little thing moving, that's what meditation is. We download a new operating system. And that's what meditation does. And as we do that now, we are forming that critical mass. Like I said earlier, critical mass is not a, 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 a ever a majority. Some people say that that hundredth monkey, that change of enough people thinking a different way to become that mutation, to become that alternative possibility, some people say it's pi, that's less than 4%. The highest I've ever heard is 11%. And so let this moment be a moment, as much as it is of grief and as much as it is of sadness, as much as this moment has taken us to our knees, let this be a moment that convinces us to stay there. Let's not just get back up and go about our normal way of business. Let's instead, having been brought to our knees this week, having brought, been brought to our knees by the sorrow in France, and having been brought to our knees by the recognition that yes, it happened in France, but our countries are vulnerable as well. Let us not get back up. Let us stay on our knees. Let us stay on our knees and atone and ask forgiveness for the mistakes that we have made. Doesn't mean you're taking blame to take responsibility. You can say, well, I'm not George Bush, or I'm not Tony Blair, I'm not whatever, it doesn't matter. We all are stewards of the karmic destiny of our nations. And we can still atone for what we think were the mistakes of our nations whether we think in terms of particular individuals who might have perpetrated what we may or may not agree with or not. And then we stay on our knees because every single day it is in that attitudinal place that we will receive our instruction. During World War II, you know, you'd have, when I actually had, the, actually had the honor back in 1990, end of 1994 and 1995, and I visited the White House, and President Clinton was saying, you know, Churchill used to come over here for like two weeks at a time, and he and FDR would sit in this room, and he went on and on. He was talking about how that could never happen today, that a world leader comes over for a couple of weeks. They would be in the maps, and you know, Churchill, and Eisenhower, and Roosevelt, and all those guys. The main Allied commanders saw the big map. But when they sent telegrams, when they sent the orders out to the generals in the field, you go here, you do that, you, you go there. The people out in the field didn't know how their individual efforts fit into the whole plan. That wasn't, there. it would be too dangerous to try to get that information out there. Plus, they didn't have to know. They knew there were general commanders. And that's what spiritual power is now. Call it the Holy Spirit or whatever else we want to call the divine alchemy happening within the three-dimensional regions. And so as we wake up every morning and we plug in, every morning knowing that just as you want to purify your body so you don't take yesterday's dirt into the day, you want to purify your heart and your mind with meditation, sending out into the day just to say in your own heart and your own way, God use me. May I be an instrument of light wherever I go. May I be an instrument of love. You send love everywhere you go before you go there. Just like an Olympic athlete told by their coach, before you make the move, see it in your mind. See it in your mind before you go to work. Send your love before you. Send your love to your employer. Some people are like, send your love to your employees. Some people know. How many of you who are married, how many of you who, who live with someone, how many of you have lovers? You don't have to actually answer this question, but I'm going to ask you anyway. How many of you prayed for your mate's happiness this morning? How many of you prayed that they be blessed this morning? How many of you even bothered to tell them how much you believe in them and have faith in them and know that they're going to be great this morning? In other words, look how much we withhold every single day from the love and the spiritual power that we could be putting out into the world. Send your love, send light, send angels, send God, send Jesus, send whatever, however these things move through your subconscious mind, into your workplace, into your nation, and ask
ask that you yourself become ablaze with that. You know, I found in my <laughs> career that's lasted a while now that my life works really well when I practice what I preach. <laughs> I'm pretty clear. This stuff is just like going to the gym. If you do it, it works. Just like the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. If you do it, then they work. These things are impersonal. They're objective, discernible laws of internal phenomena, just like they're objective, discernible laws of external phenomena. So I have seen miraculous changes in my life. I see them in my life on any given day that I do apply the principles as I understand them. When I don't apply the principles as I understand them, I'm too triggered, I didn't meditate enough, whatever, then I see what happens, I fall off the spiritual wagon, and these same principles tell us we can get back on at any time. But never, ever in my lifetime or in yours has there been a time like now. This is as serious as the alliance between Britain and the United States and other allies during World War II. Our generation did not expect this. We grew up thinking that the generation that had fought World War II had pretty much handled things. They had handled them brilliantly. We were grateful for it, but I think many of us just assumed we could cruise on from there. I think part of what is so disturbing about what's happening now is that we could have. This did not come from nowhere. I'm not saying that it's all the fault of Western nations. I'm not saying that at all. But to the extent to which we have some very serious looking to do, some very serious atonement to do, to the extent to which we are called upon to actually grieve and to feel the horror, and to actually recognize that to ask God to save us from violence when in fact we ourselves, in our name, so much violence has been perpetrated against others so irresponsibly. It's time for us to get very grown up spiritually very quickly and to atone for those errors. And then to each and every day, wake up and say, dear God, use me. And we will be led to people whose consciousness is vibrating at similar frequencies, just as every cell in the body is assigned quite miraculously to other cells with which it is to collaborate in order to serve the healthy functioning of the whole. We will find each other in the presence of other people with whom, for whatever reason, just the work to be done can be done. Sometimes it's work on an aspect of your personality. Sometimes it's work on something external happening in your city or your country. We don't need to know. We will not be given a six-month prospectus. We will not be told what's going to happen tomorrow. But if we live fully in the present moment, plugging in, asking only that we be ablaze with the light of God, then we will begin to manifest that which Moses manifests and that which Jesus manifests and that which Buddha manifests. It is not arrogant of us to believe that. It is humble for us to believe that. It is humble for us to recognize that the great religious avatars, the great religious figures of the world have demonstrated that which is only potential in us. In the Course in Miracles, Jesus himself says, I am in a state that is only potential in you. I have actualized that which is potential in you. And so, if ever there was a time for us to find our divine potential, it's now. That doesn't mean that you're going to become an enlightened master tomorrow. It doesn't mean you're going to become an enlightened master tomorrow. It doesn't mean that I'm going to become an enlightened master tomorrow. But I'm reminded of years ago when I used to do AIDS support groups. And if you had HIV, the whole issue was how, what your T cell count was. And people would be depressed on a given day, I have a low T cell count, I have a low T cell count, I have a low T cell count. And so we would do this visualization and this meditation at the end of every meeting. And what we visualized was a bowl in the center of the room. And maybe Bobby only had low T cells, but he put his in the bowl. And then maybe John only had a low T cell count, and he put his in the bowl. And maybe Gloria only had a low T cell count, but she put hers in the bowl. And then they all left there that day, carrying the whole bowl, so that everybody left with a high T cell count. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the universe is merciful. It's not like you have to become an enlightened master by tomorrow, you have to become an enlightened master tomorrow, I become an enlightened master tomorrow. But the very fact that we're here means that we're better than we used to be. The very fact that we are beginning to take things more seriously than we took them even before last Friday means that we're on the move and more dedicated, more committed than we used to be. 
And just that little bit of enlightenment you have, and that little bit of enlightenment you have, that little bit of enlightenment you have, and that little bit of enlightenment I have, it is going to grow. The Course in Miracles says that an idea grows stronger when it is shared. We will wake up every morning. We will give ourselves to the cause of the great spiritual revolution. We will find ourselves with gifts that we would not have otherwise had. In the tradition, the traditional Christianity, we call it the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You will find yourself with insight you might not have otherwise had. You will find yourself with new relationships that surprise you. You will find yourself with assignments that truly startle you. And all that it will prove to you is that even though the presence of that which we most need to have with us now is not visible to the mortal eye, as we call on that presence and surrender ourselves to the work of that presence on any given day, we are taken up on our offer immediately. While we will not see that matrix with our physical eye, we will know that the power is here because we will see what power it works in our lives. And then, miraculously, not in one day, not in two days, but over time, and even though it is near midnight, it is the 11th hour, but it is not midnight yet. This ship, this Titanic, now headed for the iceberg by whatever form, is going to turn around because we are becoming an interruptive field. And to people who think this is nonsense, don't even mention it. To people who think that this is crazy talk, why bother mentioning it? Know what you know. Practice the principles I've mentioned tonight. Don't even tell anybody. Just know that as you walk out into the world on any given day, in any given moment, joined with all the rest of us who are trying our best to do the same, to be beacons of love, to be the presence of a space of a higher possibility for whoever happened to be in our presence or our thinking on any given day. We will be a collective field of miracle workers. Our minds will be conduits for that intercession that blows open the limitations of attachment that were born of attachment to the mortal plane. To the extent to which we are attached to the mortal plane, we are at the effect of the limitations of the mortal plane. When enough of us know that the mortal plane is just delusion and we do not have to be attached to it and therefore we do not have to be limited by it because miracles occur naturally as expressions of love, there will be such a miracle on this planet. Peace will prevail even if it doesn't totally break out by the time any of us specifically pass from this plane, even then we will die knowing we had something to do with the kick-ass miracle that's on its way. Thank you very, very much.